Okay, Nietzsche, oh. 1844 to 1900. That's his, mm. his, his dates. Mm. He died young. Okay, 18, 1844 to 1900. Recently, five, six years ago, some fellow here in Israel wrote a book on Nietzsche and the Jewish orientation, what his view of Judaism was and so forth, and he took the trouble to make a list of all the passages in Nietzsche where he talks about Jews and Judaism. Hmm. And it turned out that Nietzsche wrote 12, 13 books uh, of different sizes, you know, and uh, it turns out that he talked about the Jews in 65, 68 places. Hmm. And he explains in the book what his criteria was, you know, because sometimes he didn't mention the word Jew, but he was talking about the Jews and so on and so on. Okay, and then he, he wrote this book, and he concluded, after his work, that... Nietzsche's writings contain some of the greatest praise heaped upon the Jewish people by a non-Jew since Bilaam the prophet. That's this guy. After <coughs> studying the material and putting it together, and he had some tables which show you the picture of where he wrote about this, where he wrote about that, and so on. And that was his basic conclusion, that Nietzsche was, in, in fundamental respects, pro-Jewish. And so the title of tonight's talk is Nietzsche's Jewishness. He wasn't Jewish by birth or anything, he didn't convert or anything like that. However, he had a Jewish, or he latched onto or caught certain dimensions of Jewishness and of Judaism that, for me, played a big role in widening my vistas in philosophy and getting out of classical philosophical problems and into the contemporary period. Okay, so Nietzsche. Nietzsche wrote God is Dead, one of the associations that everybody has with Nietzsche, the average person, God is Dead. He wrote a book called Beyond Good and Evil. What's beyond? What's he talking about? Very suggestive of good and evil, the phrase suggests the tree, the Eitz Hadas, Tovara, the tree of good and evil. And from what Nietzsche does, as we'll see later, uh, it's not unreasonable that he caught something that's very important that I've mentioned many times, that in the text we have two trees, however they interpret it, but we have a tree of of good and evil, see? And then we have a tree of life. And what Nietzsche surely had in his mind when he entitled the book Beyond Good and Evil, that something was beyond good and evil, the other tree. And interestingly enough, as I pointed out many times, it does not say the tree of, of life and death. It says the tree of life not the tree of life and death, even though in other parts of the Chumash it does put together Chaim and Mavit. But in the fundamental story of Gan Eden, it's the Eitz HaChaim and not Eitz HaChaim Mavit. And so what Nietzsche was talking about was for sure, when he entitled the book Beyond Good and Evil, he was certainly relating to that. Okay. And indeed, one of his other famous things that he's known for is, and it's a refrain that goes through his writings, is what he calls, Yea to life. So here we see again, God is dead. Yea to life gives a little strengthening to this intuition of mine about the name of the, name of the book. <laughs> okay. One of the things that this guy found out in his inquiries, just putting down the places where he talks about Jews and Judaism, one of the things that he found out was that most of the negative 
or the criticisms about Judaism, because Nietzsche, is, you can't just go to the texts and say, okay, here's, here's Nietzsche's Jewishness, and it's so strong that there's nothing else. He never wrote a comment against the Jews, and so well, that's not true. If you look at the texts, the different texts in different places, different contexts, sometimes he's writing against the Jews, and sometimes he's writing in favor of the Jews, and for the Jews. So now we have our problem, what, what, what sense are we going to make out of that? God is dead, but we have yet to life. What, what, how are we going to put it together? He wrote a book at the end of his life called Will to Power. All right, how are we going to put together in a consistent, coherent way any kind of a talk that will yield a conclusion <coughs> that Nietzsche had Jewishness in a very strong way and was, like this guy says, uh, a great philosopher, pro-Jewish. Okay, so that's our problem for tonight. How are we going to put these things together? So it's a, a refrain that goes through his different writings is yea to life, and that's a principle in his orientation. Okay, so this was the result of this guy, and I was saying that he found that most of the time, most of the places that Nietzsche talked against Jews, against Judaism, was in a kind of, I mean, that's the kind, most of the places, the other way around, most of the places where Nietzsche was talking favorably about Jews and Judaism was in context where he was talking about Christianity. Hmm. So in, this is what part of this guy's research found, that most of the places where Nietzsche, or a good many of the places, I won't say most, but a good many of the places that Nietzsche talks favorably about the Jews, he's in a comparative framework. Compared to the Christians, compared to Christianity, Judaism is unbelievable. <laughs> and Nietzsche wrote, Nietzsche wrote, uh, you know, this famous piece. Nietzsche wrote this famous piece that uh, I'll read it for you. In the mid 19th century, Nietzsche set forth his yea to life orientation to the individual society, poly, and culture. His non theism. God is dead, allowed him to say and do things that were beyond norms of the day. The Bible, as ordinarily viewed by non-Jews, refers to what they call the Old and New Testament as one. And Nietzsche said, again, writing about the Jews, but in the context of comparison to Christian, Christianity, Nietzsche says, the, the, the worst sin, the most abominable, abominable sin against the spirit uh, that liberal, that literary Europe has on its conscience is the gluing together of the New Testament, a kind of rococo of taste in every respect, connecting it to the Old Testament to make one book, the Bible. Now, that's an example of a very powerful statement by Nietzsche of the greatness of Judaism in the contextual, in the comparative framework. And of course, that's enough to tell you that he's pro-Jewish, that he has a Jewish side. But what we want to do tonight is to pick up and add a dimension to that view. Namely, that it's not from the comparative point of view, that's true. But there are other things in Nietzsche that are, stand on their own and are more indicative of his understanding or his favorite or his sensitivity to Judaism and Jewishness. Ju I'm using the term Judaism as the religion, which rests on a belief, a few theological beliefs, and the doing of the mitzvot, learning Torah, familiar to all of us. And Jewishness is the, a, a psychological package that's how we say, of associations that boil down to am I happy I was born a Jew or am I sad I was born a Jew? <laughs> In other words, the criterion is very simple. A person could say, look, you know, and there are people today who are leaving Judaism but have Jewishness and their Jewishness is very strong in different respects, but they're not 
in the mitzvot theologic framework that all of us grew up with. They're breaking out and taking Jewishness. And so there's a whole variation. Some link it with humanism, some link it with, with uh, how many people we have in sciences that make the Nobel Prize and so on and so on. Jew Jewishness is, uh, you know, when somebody is proud of Einstein because he didn't give in and he remembered and he kept to be Jewish, he could be wrong, he could be a bad philosopher and a good physicist, but he has Jewishness. Ben Gurion and go down the line and you see that there's a whole term and try to pin it down, and get its characteristics. However, that's where the material is today. And our problem is how do we balance out Jewishness with Judaism? For me, of course, the goal is if we don't do something, I call it to infuse Judaism with some Jewishness, <laughs> we, we're not so sure about the future. And our goal is to try to put some of that in, uh, in an organized way. And so Nietzsche uh, made this statement in the comparative sense, and it fits this guy's research that he talked positively about the Jews when he was in this uh, context. Okay. Now, Nietzsche said God is dead. Now, what do you mean by that? What? what, 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 what? And did he make an analysis? Did he study, take time out to study proofs for God's existence, <laughs> like you, like I did? I also said, you know, does God exist? And what do I do with this? Is it required for Judaism? So I studied the topic for years and came up with dead ends. <laughs> there are no proofs of <coughs> God's existence. It's a question of emunah, and the emunah can go one way where it does you beautiful service, and the other way where it annoys you no end, <laughs> and keeps you up at night because you can't, you, the mind needs, it can't be filled with too much doubt without tentative solutions or things that are working for you at the moment. So, Nietzsche did not make an analysis and intellectually come to the conclusion that since there are no proofs, don't look for it. There's no proofs. Take it or don't take it. As good in your life, as a value, but not as something in the realm of truth. Okay. So, and there are many different types, or at least two different types of people, of neshamot. There are some people that have to know things. They can't, they can't go to the doctor and keep quiet and say, oh, okay, doc, do your, do your stuff, you know. <laughs> and look at my foot and take care of that and everything. And I'm reading a newspaper or I'm reading a magazine. And there's some people, they walk in before the doctor has a chance to look at their feet. They've got to say what the medicine he's going to prescribe and this and that and this and that and this and that. On a simple plane, just in ordinary common sense, there are different, different neshamot, different people with different intellectual needs where some people don't have, don't worry about. Like what I call a munap shuta. A person accepts the Torah system, the mitzvot, the chazal, and enjoys every moment of it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And doesn't, and never was worried about, does God exist, does he not exist, and so on. It doesn't, it doesn't enter. Or it entered in adolescence, and a few years, and went out, just like it came in, and went out, and the person went on with their life, and they became X, Y, and Z, you know, doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, and, <laughs> and that was the, the, the extent of their philosophical concerns. Every once in a while they would come up in the newspaper and so on and so on. They read an article, but basically they weren't preoccupied. They weren't, they didn't lose any sleep over it. They lost sleep if they made a mistake in uh, an engineering problem and so on. You know, they were involved in work, in the day work and so on, and they manifested this thing. So Nietzsche, did not make a, from what we read, did not make a study of classical and 
modern proofs for God's existence. But God was dead. The point I'm trying to make here is that Nietzsche had no, no axe to grind, shall we say, against God's existence. In other words, the question is what is what thought package, feeling package, and actional package are going with the beliefs, even though it's a religion. But when it's taken without the seriousness, the focus of attention is on the kinds of thoughts, the kinds of feelings, the kinds of actions. And so Nietzsche said, "Look, I'm not, I'm not bur bursting over to get a conclusion." intellectually worked out that God is dead. So he has no, he's saying the fact is that God is dead. We killed him in mm -hmm. Europe. How did we kill him? How did Europe kill? It started to take seriously the authoritarian dimension of having the deity, having the God, the Creator, and so on. It started to take, put an overkill, an overemphasis on this. And this emphasis started with the shift from the anti antiquated world of Moshe Rabbeinu to the world of the prophets and the monarchy. Mm. That in the prophets and monarchy time, the old, what's called old Israel, or the Hebrew culture, was shifted, took on a different balance. Life was still the value. The Old Testament, the old antiquity, was built around the notion of life. However, we talk about that in different ways and different times. But the point is, whatever that means, but the point is, the value, the principle that organized society was a concept of life, very different than the one we have today, which is limited to the biological, the biological picture, and we'll, we'll touch some of that later and, and in other other talks. But the basic point was that Nietzsche had no axe to grind against uh, the, this, and it began the shift began in the monarchy kings period, where the whole system that was inherited from the old world of the Hebrews took on a theological character whereby life was still the fundamental value but it was the fundamental value of God. In other words, you had to pray for life and that was part of the thing. In, words, in Moshe Rabbeinu, that's what I try to show in a number of places, I try to show that when you're dealing with Moshe and the Hebrews, you're dealing with life directly. And when you take this anthropological approach to the text, like I'm suggesting, when you look at the text of the Chumash anthropologically as an old society, an antique, a society from antiquity, you see and you get the material that they're very different than from us, and they were built on a, on a conception of life I call it life energy, but they were built on a conception of life which was not mediated by belief in a God. And so that was the beginning. Indeed, this guy who made the survey, he said it in his own language. He's saying that when Nietzsche was talking about the early period of Israel culture when we became a big nation international scene, we were a nomadic people, had minimal social structure, minimal, we had a culture. And it went deeper than what's reported in the text, in the Kumish text. There was a Hebrew culture. Okay, so that culture was built on life. This other one was built on God, whose basic property was life. Hmm. And so that, didn't, that played a role in the eventual outcome of how Judaism came down in the modern world. But at the time, it wasn't bad. It wasn't disturbing. It wasn't, I mean, it was just there. It's a God culture, okay? So it's there, but it's not dominant and pre being preoccupied. 
except by the philosophers who in the medieval period, later than that, much later, dealt uh, post-Greek to work out and understand more about God as a being and all the rest of it. But now we're talking about uh, 10th century Christian era. The king, the Shlomo Melech, is uh, 800 BCE. So we're talking a different slant. However, the point I'm trying to make on this point is that it's not a total black picture. Sometimes I paint it that way to emphasize it, but it's not a total black picture at that time. But when Chazal reorganized what they inherited from the world of the prophets and the world of exile, the prophets included in their exposition, in their material, the basic material of Midrash, Gemara, and so forth, the great works, classical works of, of Judaism, they included in it what they picked up from the changes that the Navi made. And one can, if one looks at the material, my contention is that he will find much more uh, softening up of God and a building up of psychological things, of the mitzvot, of the rich, trying to capture the richness of the personality and the human being. And not so much wrapped up in a philosophical elite question about the God and his role. Okay, that was Chazal. My contention is if we look for it, we will find more than we really think comes down in the Rambam's 13 principles and so on. We'll find much more that's human, that's, in our term, at least psychologically worked out. Okay, so here was Chazal, but history went on. And what came down as Judaism was Chazal, with in my contention, laying on the side, waiting for a time when it's going to be operative and investigated and studied and found. And in one of the books I wrote on Chazal, I tried to do that. Took a hundred pieces, 75 pieces of Chazal, and told the reader how they should read it such that they come out or they see in it these set conclusions that I'm putting in. You know, he's going in with a program. We're going in with a program. We're saying we should find something in there that we haven't found. Let's look for it. And I said, let's, baby, let's tell the reader how to read, how to read Midrashim that are ready with many, many commentators. But the commentators are greats. We talk about the greats in the Gaonim and the Rishonim and so on. And, uh, up to today. We're talking about the greats, but they, they they didn't look. They took it for granted that this kind of thing we're talking about, that what is life, what is Chaim in this whole system, and how does it function, so on, they didn't take it as the dominant set of questions. So, Judaism went on, and we had the psychological revolution of Freud, and the forerunner before and after, where what happened was in the 19th century, in 20th century, and into today, into today, the presence of God in the picture, even with the shift of dominances towards thoughts, actions, feelings, came home to create the problems of where we are. <laughs> Guilt remained in the system. Well, Freud said, look, guilt is a killer. Guilt, well, you can't have a cup of coffee without anxiety. You're in, a, you're in, a, you're in an anxiety-ridden world that's coming in from God as an authority figure. So in our time, there was an anti-life dimension that became manifest. What I'm trying to show now is putting the thing in a long perspective. 
uh, sometimes I talk to the contrary, make it to make the points more, uh, you know, rhetorically powerful. But strictly speaking, there's a movement, and that movement had shifted dominances. And today, we're eating the dicer. Hmm. We're eating the dicer in Judaism, hmm. in relation to kashrus, especially sexuality. Hmm. And in our contemporary period, the gender issue, we are now in effect saying and seeing that classical Judaism, continuation of Chazal into the modern and contemporary world, are giving us problems, giving Torah people problems, because we're not addressing adequately enough these issues. Issues of life, the fundamental characteristics of life are eating and sexuality. So, with God in the middle, Freud is dealing his whole life with sexuality. Okay, he's saying, look, most of my patients were Jewish who came to me in the beginning. Never mind the history, the Jewish psychoanalysis and so on, but the basic point was, he heard, he heard stories, he, heard, he had patients who had all of this guilt that was coming in from the religion, per se, dealing with life, but mediated by what has become an anti-life principle. And so, where we are today is having to deal, with, as Torah people, with this anti-life dimension. How do we relate, or bring back, or restore, shall we say, restore the richness first of Chazal, that there's something in there that we didn't find, and more important, or no less important, restore the richness in the antique, antiquated, antique society of the Hebrews. So that there's a double layer. Eventually, Judaism is not built on an antiquated understanding of the world. But, in this analysis, to go back to that antiquated understanding of the word of the world, anthropology is a godsend. Hmm. In other words, we are entering the text and trying to inquire: What is? How does this thing working? Here's a tribe, an Indian tribe. Here's a Drobrian Islanders, and here's different cultures. And it was Lady Strauss, who was a great archaeo, a great anthropologist for a hundred years, passed away recently. Whatever. The point is that we're, we, we are finding it valuable to enter the text of antiquated societies and then see what we can use for contemporary life in, which center around these problems. And my analogy is simple. Everybody knows that every pharmaceutical company in R&D and research and development has a team of anthropologists on staff who are examining songs and literature from a culture, uh, Indian culture or whatever, and trying to understand that they put this leaf and they rubbed it with this and that, and that <laughs> or they drank urine, or they this or did that, all kinds of things that had work, I call them work abilities. They worked. You say, my God, how can the guy, how can the guy drink urine? Of course, it didn't mean he went to the bathroom. <coughs> it meant there was some mixture and some blend of things that included a fundamental idea of antiquity that waste product, waste product of the human organism, is still life. Indeed, we put our, we put manure on the field. Right? We we have life dimensions in everything, and especially in the human being, and especially in waste products. In other words, we're not that, it's not just to be thrown away, it's to be investigated how they operate. And so we have blood transfusions today. Well, I mean, how do we do that? I mean, we take somebody's blood and we put it to another person and so on. Well, what's the other thing going? It's being extract, pulled out of the body and now being used for a medical purpose. So everybody knows that in research and development, every, every pharmaceutical company has a team of anthropologists 
Okay? So I say, wait a minute. Let's get a team of anthropologists to enter the ant antiquated culture called the Hebrews with Moshe. Okay? Let's get enter like an anthropologist with respect to, oh, not just med medicinals. We're not interested primarily only, shall I say, with medicinals. We are, because if we discovered a cure for cancer in, in the Chumash, it would be triple time the bestseller. Because just out of curiosity, uh, we'd want to read the account, just, uh, how it was discovered and so on, so on, so on. But the basic point is that you have this, uh, this uh, research and development on now on something else that's interesting and very important for us. What is logic? What is mathematics? How could it be that mathematics, which is a pure construction of the human being, of the human mind, is the key to unlock the laws of nature, which are the furthest away. The laws of nature cannot be reduced to the human mind. But how did, uh, well, nobody gave an answer. What is logic? What is mathematics? What are clues to understand the life system? Is it amenable to a scientific picture and a technology that goes on the basis? Our questions, which are at the forefront of Western civilization, I'm suggesting should be entered into by an anthropologist. An anthropological mindset not historical, not religious, not philosophical, but an attempt to get at the, the roots of that old culture. And so, when I did it in my simple way, and I found this work by Pedersen, 1926, Israel, Its Life and Culture, and he was a uh, philologist, so he entered with philology, word origins, and his orientation was anthropological, and he dealt with the problems. How did they think? Did they have logic? And he, you come up with some interesting surprises. What was the role of the performative? You heard me many times on that. What, 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 what was the basic view of language? Performatives, commands, assertions. What, 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 what was the combination? What, what had dominance? What played a role? So he took contemporary problems at the forefront of psychology, the forefront of philosophy, the forefront of, uh, of science concerning a life system, and said, here are some clues, do what you want with them. Here I'm presenting you a descriptive picture of this culture. And in that he says, they didn't have logic. They didn't think in logical terms. They thought by associations. They convinced by amassing a package of associations. In my language, I stressed it in one of the books, that by having a performative that a person makes on himself, he says, I am Jewish, I am an Israeli, blah, 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 blah. With that performative, there is an associative package. What he says, how he talks about things, as he, as he just talks in conversation. He's filling in what that performance is. The performance is the status he puts on himself. He's Jewish. But the association package is, is the operational working out, shall we say, of that thing that he made on himself. I'm Jewish. Because there are many, enough Jew Jewishnesses for as many people. Each person has a different packaging. So I put it in that way, but that's not the, the main point. The main point is that we're entering the text as with an anthropological mindset to find in the ancient culture things that will function for those who are not interested at the moment in pharmaceuticals, but are interested in the nature of logic, in the nature of communication, in problems of the kind, and who are interested, overwhelmingly so, in nutrition, eating, and sexuality. Maybe we can learn something from some of these cultures because maybe they're 
basically anxiety free, guilt free. Not every not every one of these cultures is uh, is the same as ours. We're struggling with the problem, but it could be the culture in the culture at the at the point they, they, they don't have any problems. There's no guilt. There's no need to undo the guilt. It doesn't exist. There's a health a healthy dimension. Now I studied. Uh, there was once when I was Yakar, uh, well, part of the group. There was a guy who was uh, came in from California. Was part of the group. Learned, you know, we learned Torah, you know, Gemara. But we had schmooze, you know, you talk and discuss and and he started talking about the Indian. He was the lawyer, a lawyer by profession for the Indian culture, American Indian. And he told many, many stories that were anthropological in nature and, you know, how they, how they celebrated the rain and the rain festival and this and that and so on. Well, I couldn't stop listening. It was fantastic. Or you go on TV and you get uh, the, ch the Nature Channel and you go on, you're getting National Geographic. Sometimes you can't put the article down. I mean, it's so interesting. So I remember for myself, uh, I always learned so much from, I was, you know, every time I saw a program and they talked about lions and tigers and this, so my mind gravitated to Chumash, a pasuk that said the lion. <laughs> and I, I, I was automatically, I was interested in Torah, and whatever I picked up about eating habits, whatever the thing was, that I picked up from the TV on the National Geographic over years enriched my whole understanding of animals in the Torah thing and in Midrash. I mean, you can tell them, you, you, you could fill in for yourself. Okay, so the basic point here is to enter the text with an anthropological mindset, searching for what and if and how these ancient cultures, but especially ours, it includes the rest, it includes Egypt, Babylonia, Canaan, but for Torah people, first and foremost is our own tradition, the vestiges of which, of this culture, are in the text, especially in Torah Moshe, where the text is a uh, 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 <coughs> conglomeration or a packet, a set of workables, things that work. And work in the sense of, it's good to know that, well, you don't have to think about time. One of our great problems today, what is time? It's blocking research in all the domains. What is time? Well, you don't have to be limited to one conception of time. There are conceptions of time where there's no future, no past, whatever that means. There are some languages that have no future and past tense, uh, grammatically. Chiti and Hebrew is one of them. So what's happening here? As we enter with an anthropological mindset in the positive sense to try to get things that will help relate to our contemporary problems to give uh, intuitions. We're not ready yet for a science. Maybe it's impossible. Maybe it's not. But our material that we have today is not rich enough. So we're adding to our bank of materials an anthropology of the biblical text. And that is, for me, was big pay dirt. When I discovered this, this Pedersen book, which was incidentally the main work in all the Protestant seminaries in the United States and elsewhere. This book was, when I found it in a bookstore, my copy was burnt, the pages were charred, but it wasn't reprinted and you couldn't get it. You had to do it in the library. I read it in the library. And one day I found this two volumes, it's four volumes but in two. Well, I mean, I paid ten dollars or twelve dollars, whatever. In those days it was a lot of money, but it was great. I mean, I read it and I it's one of the few books I don't lend out because if I get lost, I'll be in trouble. Now they reprinted it and so on and so on. But the basic point was, this was, I used to attend Union Theological Seminary, and that's across the street from Columbia, which is the Protestant seminary, a great institution of learning. I used to sit with the keeper, and of course, they all asked me, 
uh, what about this word in the back? I said, look, I don't know anything. <laughs> but uh, sitting in the seminary with Ayanka, uh, they figured I must know something. <laughs> but I didn't know anything. What did I know? The roots of this, the roots of this. That's when I first time I ever saw the mock-up pencils. Those, those, an orange thing, you know, you mock up your, like you mock up, uh, you know, you mock up the, 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 I never saw that before. It was a big eye-opener because they had Bibles. If you go into a Protestant seminary, their Bible has got blue, green, polka dot, yellow, this, uh, because they're, uh, they're organizing the psukim in relation to the New Testament how certain things were denied, certain things were developed, so, so that one of their jobs is to show the forerunnings of the New Testament in the Old. And so part of this line, underline, so that guy could flip, I was amazed, he would flip the pages, you know, he'd, psh, psh, this is yellow, yellow means this and this in relation to Paul, or coming in in the New Testament. So part of the work of the people in the courses was to relate was to relate Old Testament materials to uh, uh, materials in the New Testament and show what the development, or don't say anything about the development, just show the connections and so on and so on. So that there was a, a precursor. And I mean, the Old Testament was a, was a kind of a, a base and then a takeoff point for the way Christianity went. Now, I personally never followed up what happened to Patterson in the Christian seminaries and Protestantism. I never followed up whether it still was the best, or how long it was until it was, uh, you know, uh, discarded. But in the Torah materials, in the research that's been done in the last 50 years, the last 40 years, 30 years, a lot by Israelis and our own institutions in Israel, somehow the anthropological approach has I won't say disappeared, but has not been dominant. This guy will tell you, oh, don't forget, the Hebrews didn't think the way we think. They didn't think in logic. They didn't have our conception of time. He says it explicitly. Well, I read 25 books of Chochem Sisrael people, some of them are in the, in the, you know, in the Xerox copies from the library. And I haven't come across anything where somebody says their way of thinking was so and so and so and so, it's not ours. In other words, somehow it got lost as a dominant topic. I didn't read all the literature, but it, enough that I read, I see that. There were, at a certain period, there was a guy named Josephs who was very big on the Egyptian basis of Hebrew culture. And as you know, when I discovered uh, the Egyptian this book uh, on the the Olive, the Frenchman in 1912, 1812, who wrote on the reconstruction or the, uh, the restoration of the Hebrew language based on the hieroglyphics, well, that was a big fetish for me, and I used it over the years, and I learned a lot from his translation. He has a translation, a commentary on the first ten chapters, and in addition he has a lexicon of the language. And I spoke about it a few times, we'll spoke about it some other time, but the basic point is that this was a concern with the Hebrew language that's coming out of Egypt, okay, that's coming out of Egypt, and somehow it got lost in the materials that have come through. After Kasudal, for example, Cana, uh, Mesopotamia and Canaan were the, were the backdrop that was needed. Remember, you once borrowed a book on Mesopotamia. That's the classic book. I forget the name, but the, that's the classic book that you do when you take a Bible course. You know, somehow there was a shift away from the Egyptian focus, Egyptian influence, to the Akkadian Canaan interest, and the research went in a different direction. So, to short, what am I saying? I'm saying, well, if we enter the biblical text with an anthropological mindset and try to project ourselves into the way they thought, the way, like an anthropologist, 
one of his conclusions would be, look, I lived with this culture for six months, and uh, somebody would say to him, boy, you're acting just like the chief. Well, that's a compliment. That means his behaviors had a little bit, they forgot that he was an anthropologist from Harvard, but, but well, some of it does rub off, especially in these problems, because in my study of Piaget, which some of you heard about, I spent a lot of time on Piaget, in my study of Piaget, it looks as if the child goes through stages of development, of development of language, of feelings, and so forth, and, and thought. The child goes through stages that look like, the way Piaget describes them, look like an antiquity culture. So I even proposed that crazy thing for NASA. I once said I wanted to get a think tank and have a, you know, work here. I didn't want to go abroad there, but I wanted to have a think tank with a physicist, mathematician, child psychologist to, to say the child may live in a quantum-like world. The child live in a world where there's no future, no past. But maybe by having this team pulled together, we could discover from studying of the child that the child doesn't talk. The child can't tell you what's, <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> okay? But maybe the team could put together some research that we could make models of characteristics of space, of outer space, gravity less things, and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on, to help us and be in addition to, or be as a supplement to models that cost millions of dollars by NASA about on, on testing, you know, how the person's going to evacuate, you know, and go to the bathroom and this and that in, in the space, uh, space world. Okay. Can we take a quick break? So yeah. I, I got to change the uh, thing Good. here. Quick. Yeah. Anyway, this is setting up the, the, the backdrop. Wherein we'll talk about Nietzsche, and when you look and read and study his materials, you see that as a contemporary person, not from the ancient world, he caught, he caught an aspect of the ancient world in terms of the modern picture. When he talked about life, when he talked about understanding about thought, he didn't, he didn't stick to logic. He wrote in aphorisms. He wrote in a poetic style. And he communicated not in the normal classical way of concepts building one on top of the other, and putting together a conclusion, a set of conclusions. So his writing style and his whole orientation did not make use of the classical texts. Second, in his writing you see there are a lot of performative utterances. There are a lot of first-person bestowal utterances he puts on himself and others put on others. And so, uh, Thus Spake Dharatustra, right, one of his books and one of his characters, was, and if you read it, you see, it's written, you know, like with, quote, this, Dharatustra said this, somebody said this, the Nachash said that, and so on and so on. It's dialogic. And included in the dialogic is a moving away from the usual way philosophers write which is definitions, clarity, clear and distinct ideas, still from Descartes. That's the goal of the writing. And Nietzsche is saying, look, there's vagueness, there's indeterminacy. Our language is an overkill on sharpness, on determinateness. When we say, uh, when we say uh, milk, we tend to deal with it abstract in an abstraction. 
it doesn't trigger off the taste or anything. It's just milk and, and it has an association. You buy it in the store, you pay this, and then it went up in price. Right? But it, the words, the discussion, the use of the terms don't, they don't engage the senses. They, they, they're up in an abstract space. We call it a mind space. But it doesn't, doesn't relate to the bottom. So when we talk about literature, we talk about literature versus, versus or the arts versus philosophy, well, Nietzsche made a big place in his whole understanding for non-philosophical productions which yield philosophical insights. We're keeping the focus on what we're concerned with. We're not concerned with pharmaceuticals. That's not our concern. We're concerned with the ways people think, the ways people communicate, the male-female relationship, and so on and so on. So we're concerned with those things, indeed, that are written about in the Kumish text and in the Chazal. We're life realia, life concreta. Nietzsche oriented and penetrated into the concretization of everything and has a big whole re rejuvenation of the arts. Uh, for me, it was big at the time. Never, never looked at the arts. What does the philosopher got to do with da the dance, with music, with uh, painting? And, and those, these whole things, these domains were like outside of my repertoire, my material. What, what am I going to do? I'm reading John Stuart Mill, I'm reading Kant and this, but what, what, what is it? What, what is well, in a sense, you know, Nietzsche pointed out, and I learned from that, that one's philosophy is always tied to one's person, to who he is, how he looks at himself. I never thought like that. I never thought like that. I said, philosophy is concerned with the truth. So we're dealing with arguments. I never put myself in. I said, what do you mean? It's me? That, that you should understand a little bit about who's writing the philosophy? I threw that out 50 years ago when I began, 60 years ago. I didn't, I say, who, who? I tell the students, here's, here, like I said tonight, here, see, carry over? Nietzsche, 1844, 1900. Now let's talk. And I was, who was he? What was he? I mean, it was irrelevant. Did I have to talk about Greek culture when I gave a course on Plato? I, I taught Plato. Or I taught Aristotle. When the student raised his hand and said, oh, you know, with your shita, your viewpoint on Aristotle is not really right because this word means something else that you said. Well, my answer was, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm a philosopher. I'm giving you the best of my understanding of a coherent picture of the particular set of points we're dealing with the ethics, the politics, his conception of logic, whatever I was dealing with. And if it doesn't fit the language, you could leave it remaining a question. But in the meantime, you got one coherent picture with these particular problems left over, because you usually don't get completeness, but I'm giving you one picture which you can say after the course, you know a little bit about Aristotle. Okay? But I never opened the track. The first one that opened me up to all of this was Freud, because I studied Freud, and then I realized, oh my God, uh, psychoanalysis is going to start to enter and reveal things about me that I should know. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm working on, the, on a, riding on a philosophical cloud, okay? And not, no, not it's not it's not hitting the real problems of life. Getting married, having children, blah, 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 down the line. I mean, it, 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 it just wasn't there. And when I read Nietzsche as a philosopher, he talked to me. The first time I read it, he talked to me. And in effect, he says, you know, think about yourself a little bit and try to know what's making you tick. And at the same time, or after that, or, you know, coterminous with that, study the philosophical problem that you're interested in. But don't go on the assumption that you, Joe Levinson, are irrelevant. You're not going to learn anything about the nature of logic, 
about uh, about the nature of uh, of existence and so on and so on and so on. Well, that's not true. That's just not true. I learned from Nietzsche, first Freud, and then Nietzsche, that you don't have to give history of the person. You don't have to make a special session where you're going to talk about who Nietzsche was, his parents, and so on and so on and so on. But at least in the discussion of the person, wherever it is an opening to talk about the personal, don't shy away, bring it in. And indeed, bring in your own personal. And I broke records by teaching because I didn't teach the way everybody taught. Because what are you afraid of? To, to show your weaknesses and your strengths to a student? Why are you worried? Maybe the student will see that you do it as the professor, that they should do more of it and realize that it's them as a whole person that's sitting in the class, not just a disembodied intellect. That if I'm coming across as a disembodied intellect, then that's what I'm teaching. And, and life is all out there, <laughs> and I'm cutting off a 1% slice that makes me a philosopher. Now, all of that comes out of the Nietzschean understanding. So that it's not just that he was positive about Judaism and Jews from the point of view of the comparison with Christianity as a backdrop. There are all pieces in nature, just like he said in his first section, there, as a conclusion, there are pieces in nature that capture the life dimension of the personality. And indeed, Freud paid his debt to Nietzsche and said, look, uh, what Freud did and, and what, what I'm doing, Freud, in a, uh, putting, trying to put psychoanalysis on the map, study of consciousness and so forth, I learned a lot from Nietzsche who works exactly with this kinds of material. So, in answer to the question, so, so, so this is the point about language. Nietzsche did not stick to the usual language. I don't say he went back into antiquity, but he certainly put emphasis on something that was somehow not in the, in the wind. And as you know, the, the notion of a performative, all the antiquated cultures, when it dealt with rites, R-I-T-E-S, right, with rituals, they're all involved with performatives. They're all involved with performatives. When a man, when a guy made a peso, an idol, and he said, Hareze Baal, okay, we know sticks and stones will break my bones and things will never harm me. But in antiquity, because don't you ever ask yourself a question? How could anybody believe in idolatry? When you know it's the same piece of wood that I'm going to burn tomorrow and I put in the fire. That's a god? That has something to do with divinity? That's something to do with the basis of my culture? For us, that's total nonsense. If somebody says that, we put them in a booby hatch. But in that time, idolatry was the fundamental characteristic of the cultures. Why? Because they thought that the word makes the thing. It's like a word magic. When you say, I am Jewish, or Hareyat Nekudeshitli, or use a performative, the performative use of language creates the existence. And indeed, in the Chumash, what do we see? Yehi or Fayehi or. In the text, the text is telling you that the paradigm of creation is the performative. Now, most people would say, wait a minute, how does God make a performative? Well, he used word magic. Because for God, he could have the word become the thing. But whether that's true or not, it's not necessary. But for the person, for the person on looking, looking on it, Bill, on, and person looking on it, he said, yeah, you know, words can have power. 
words in particular are performative, has power, has energy, has a dimension behind it. And so idolatry in that time was reasonable. It made 100% sense. For us, it's absurd. For them, it was built into the culture. And for thousands of years and hundreds of years, the main problem was how do we bypass, avoid, refute idolatry? And how do we avoid idolatrous thinking in Torah? We could make God into an idol. That's what I mean. And so, again, the performer is at the center. So rites and rituals, you read any book in anthropology on rites and rituals of an antiquated society, of an antique society, and you will see they cannot go and explain without the notion of the performative. For us, that's a big problem. But look, when did it come into vogue? 1960-something when, when uh, Austin, John Austin wrote his book on the performative utterance. Where was it all the years in philosophy? Every legal system from Romans, every legal before the Romans, every legal system is built on the notion of performative legal statuses that are established by word, a word. You say something and you establish a legal status which has consequences for life. Before the guy said, Hooray on the he can go out with any girl he wants. As soon as he says that, the next day, he now has the status of being married, and then there are consequences. He can't do that. It's, he could do it, of course, but he's not allowed by the law that's formulated in terms of the performatives. Well, where was it all the centuries in philosophy? It's been around for the longest time, not only in rites and rituals, but then in the legal systems and everything. What, we had laws before then, we had Roman law, Constantine was 333, Christian era. We had the world of the Bible. We had the world of the Talmud. Where was all this non-assertive, performative use of language? It entered philosophy in the 20th century, mid-20th century, 1964, whatever his book was, 66 or something like that. So where was it all the years? I never used it. I never taught like that. And now, what do I see? By emphasizing the performative, I see I've been translating the text wrong. I'm just finishing the books on the new understanding of the first six days of creation. What was it all about? It says explicitly, Yehi Vayhi. Yehi Vayhi in each of the days. Never mind explaining how it works. That is the form. That's the form. It's a not assertion. I took it as an assertion, Elohim said. Let there be this. I took it, Omar meant said. It means declare. To declare is to say, I declare. That's what a declaration is. In the Chumash, you have pieces, and then at the end it says, Ani Hashem. That's a performative. That's when you sign a letter, and you say, you know, with your signature, that's a performative. That closes the letter. The letter is dealing with assertions. You do this or advice or whatever. And then you close it with a seal, like a signature. And the signature is a performative function. It can be ritualized or whatever, but it's a performative function. It's a non-assertion use of language. And I stressed it many times. There are three basic uses. Command, performative, and assertion. And the biblical orientation, and I'm showing it to you now, better late than never, but I'm showing the reader how when you enter the text with a wider view of what it's all about, you realize you've been translating the thing wrong. Now, from the point of view of trying to explain how we're still in the dark, that's not the point. The point is that in point of fact, there is a performative use of language, which is dominant. I asked and I said, why don't the reader imagine living in a culture, and it's really a culture of a child, where everything it says in learning how to speak 
is the performative. And then it moves into assertions, commands, and by the age of 12 and 13, it already lost, it lost that, quote, primitive dimension of thinking and has become now logical thinking, the growth of logic in the child. And so the psychological process, okay, the psychological process itself has shown that the child in an early age, Piaget wrote a book, Play, Dreams, and something or other of the child. And in there you analyze child dreams. And I found, for example, by reading Piaget, I try to think back, how would the culture at the time accept a look at the story? Well, I made the example on the fourth day, you know, they made the, they made a painting, you know, a child. And then they noticed they had in it was light, so you could see things. You know, and there was differentiation, the difference between this color and that color, and so on, so on, so on. First day is light, second day is differentiation, the third day is space, fourth day is time, and then we have fifth and sixth day, which is not for now, but it also giving you the basics of the society, of the culture. And so you, you saw in each of these days, the basic form was the performative, and I asked the I noticed from reading the Piaget, you know, anything that moves in the sky is the result of wind. Everything that the child dreams, anything that moves in the sky is by mover, the mover is wind, what we call ruach, not spirit, wind. And that comes through in the child's package of dreams. So when the sun moves from this side to that side, through your window, and the water moves. Every, anything that moves is a result of wind. And Piaget develops and, show, and analyzes the dreams of the early child. And so what I discovered was the child, though we can't, we can't talk, we can't, we, if the child could talk, we would understand much, much more about the development of the child. And in this respect, that the child is going through, the child is not starting, let's put it this way, the child is not starting with an assertive language. He's growing into assertion language. In the West, the dominance is assertion. In the Orient, it's not such a fast growth. Their model is not Einstein relativity and not quantum and not uh, Bertrand Russell symbolic logic. Their orientation is much more tuned in to the rite and the ritual and the performative. If you read the book, Book of the Dead, and the other materials from the Orient, you see inside is the, is the uh, performative. And so what you had here was Nietzsche, by using uh, short language, he had the, he wrote, uh, number one, uh, three sentences, number two, three sentences. He wrote in, in a style which was to say the least, not highly exemplary of assertive language. It had command and it had the performative in it. And he wrote in such a way that exploded the, the classical conception of, of logic. As a matter of fact, when I first started Nietzsche, on the one hand I learned so much and I opened my whole vista. On the other hand I said, where's his logic? Where's his discussion of physics? It ain't there. There's no discussion of logic in Nietzsche. He didn't write a book on logic. Everybody wrote a book on logic. Everybody wrote a book on logic. Hegel wrote a book on logic. Kant wrote a book on logic. Mill wrote a book on logic. Uh, logic and technology and science is the, is the guts of Western civilization. Democracy and science. So where's Nietzsche's contribution? Where, 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 where's his logic? So I said, well, I learned a lot, but on one thing, he's short. He ain't got no logic. I need logic because I'm talking about science. I'm talking about what do we gain from science, what don't we gain? What kind of technology are we going to be able to build? And indeed, the problem that preoccupied me was the life system. Is it amenable to scientific analysis? What would it be? Can we get clues? Can we develop it in such a way that we can have a technology built on the life system 
analogous to or enough power as we have building bridges and uh, the so skyscraper and so on, which is built on Newtonian physics and not on, uh, you know, and not on quantum and relativity. Okay, so we see this uh, in the language. And while I'm talking about the language, there's a lot of myths that grew up. First, because Nietzsche was very close to Wagner. Wagner was lived in Nietzsche's house for a year and a half. He was he was Wagner's secretary, and he thought that Wagner would be a revolution in music. That he was in philosophy. He found out that not, Wagner was really an anti-Semitic person, and he did know something about the music apparently, uh, which is not my field at all. He talked about Handel. He talked about Bach. And uh, he did talk, talk, you know, music talk about Wagner, which I didn't enter because I don't know enough to talk any sense about that. But the basic point is that Nietzsche thought that Wagner would be this revolution in music, in opera. Incidentally, now on mezzo, it, it's the anniversary of Wagner. They're playing Wagner's uh, operas and so forth, and overtures and all the rest. Okay. And... Uh, in my uh, early years, you know, I was a big Wagner fan, not because I knew anything about music, but because, uh, you know, the Metropolitan was two dollars to stand, and you stood with all the great musicians who were <laughs> frustrated that they didn't get any job, and you stood there, and uh, I just did it to show that, well, you see, you can be a Torah person, but you don't have to follow everything and have a law of conscience, you know, because I never got a good answer from my father why I couldn't listen to the opera on Saturday afternoon. It was a Metropolitan, you know, uh, program, uh, uh, Saturday afternoon, where you had, they, on the radio, they gave you the full opera. So I was a Lone Ranger fan. Radio, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night, 7.30, well, I never got a good answer. Why I can't listen to Lone Ranger? Okay, that's Tonto and this and that. But the opera, I mean, that's a different thing. It's high level and music and, you know. That. So where was the answer? Okay, so instead I went to the opera and I even had friends there that would also stand for the same two dollars. And on Wagnerian operas, which are very long, we used to give the usher a dollar or two and for that dollar or two, people walked out at the end of the second act. And so the standing room only was in the back of the mezzanine, the ground floor. And so those were 750 That was the, the most expensive seat <laughs> at the time, $7.50. So you paid a dollar to stand, two dollars, I think, to stand. And then by giving the usher a dollar, you went in to sit down with all the high level of people, you know, we have, old, you know, jeans and, <laughs> and we would sit there with all the people dressed up with all the jewelry and uh, real Wagnerian fans because there were people who read the libretto and uh, and I was once there just to make a joke out of the thing. I mean, I was once there and a, all of a sudden the guy comes next to me and grabs me by the arm and says, come outside. I said, why? I'm going to lose my place. He says, I'm pleased. What I do? Well, the next guy started to sing out loud during the opera. He was had the libretto and he was putting forth. And this guy who was next to me, they wanted to make sure who they're going to arrest. <laughs> so they kicked this guy and some other guy out who were frustrated opera singers, and there were no jobs, you know. And so they. <laughs> They decided to go go for it. When they had the, the chorus or something, they, they went for it. Of course, I mean, after all, uh, you know how to do that. <laughs> you know, but anyway, this is the, this is the basic thing. So in those years, uh, so we do crazy things searching for identity. One of mine was going to the opera and, and hearing Wagner. I heard everything, all of the arias and all of the material and so forth. And indeed, after a while, I took a date, you know, it was a great, you didn't have to talk, you just enjoyed the music, you know. And this was the, the whole picture. Anyway, so Nietzsche 
knew something about the music of Wagner, but basically he was linked with Wagner, and the myth grew up that Nietzsche was pro-Nazi. Because, for whatever the reasons, it was included in this woman's book on Hitler's uh, famous, you know, main philosophers, Nietzsche was included. Heidegger is understandable, he joined the party in 1933, the Nazi party. Okay, so, but Nietzsche, Nietzsche is talking about 1890, uh, you know, 1888, 18, the latter part of the last 20 years of the 19th century. There's no Nazism. So the myth grew up that Nietzsche was pro, pro-Nazi. But indeed, it wasn't pro-Nazi. He, many places, writes about anti-Semitism, against it, completely against it. He, he, in politics, he was totally against nationalism, saw its dangers of totalitarianism, and wrote about it in some of his books. So that Nietzsche was not uh, an exemplification of Mein Kampf. However, however, where he is an exemplification is in his use of language. Not now the performative, but the substantive language of Yea to Life. Nietzsche uses, made use of the life health metaphors, the life health language. So in addition to saying yea to life, when he writes, he writes in a way that is exhibiting these words. And indeed, he adapted the German language to his, his basic moves. And so, his style of writing in aphorisms, the content of the writing, fed into the notion of Arianism and the specialness of the of the German people, and the interpretation of Zarathustra as the Superman. The word in German was Übermensch, the overman. But in 1910 and 1915, when Nietzsche was translated after World War I, in my suggestion, after World War I, which was a war against the, Germany, the translations at that time of the Nietzschean corpus into English the translations were such that they did reflect this pro, pro Germany, pro nationalism, anti Semitism, and so forth. So these things were built into the myths that grew up about nature. And when I first read them, one of the things that turned me off, because I read those old translations. Now, of course, they're worth something, because I get $50 if somebody wants one of the old books. But what happened in the meantime was, in 1944, Walter Kaufman from Princeton redid translation of the Nietzschean corpus. And he translated the material, and he worked on his letters, all kinds of things, did a tremendous amount of research, and a lot of uh, you know, work went into a retranslation, a new translation, post-war, after the World War II, a new translation, I think in 1944, at the end of the war, new translation of Nietzsche, which brought out these aspects that I'm talking about that were somehow eclipsed in the early translations. As you know, in philosophy and other things, it can play a big role. A translation that's missed the boat, that's wrong, can be dominant for centuries, as I'm just indicating about the Chumash text. We're reading the Chumash text every time, and I'm not... And, uh, and, it's, and it's something different. And I mentioned last time that, uh, you know, uh, the Olivet, the Frenchman on the dictionary, when I looked just for the fun of it, he translates, and God declared. I didn't, not me! You would say, okay, you should change it. So I, I changed the translation. Good. But I, but I discovered it. And then I go to the book, and he, and he writes, instead of saying, he said, it says he declared. Where did he get that? Where did he get it? I mean, I, don't really, I would say, oh my God, he understood the performance. Maybe he didn't. He just, well, remember, he was a linguist. He was a philologist. And like, uh, like Pedersen, he came in with the emphasis on language. He saw what I saw. The paradigm is ye he by he. Uh, performative use. 
So he caught this, and in his translation of the first ten chapters, he said the first chapter is, and God declared. Okay, this is the this is the thing, unbelievable, but like fingerprints, proof that somebody other than me. So here we are reading the text for so many centuries, and what is the significant? What is the difference? What is the difference between an assertion and a performative? An assertion is true or false for the West. An assertion is true or false. The book is red, the book is green, the moon is made of green cheese, and so on, so on, so on. The, 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 the assertive form of language is amenable to truth or falsity. The performative use of language is not amenable to truth. It's not to do with truth or falsity. It either is efficacious, has value, or doesn't have value. Relates to things in existence. But it's not asserting anything. It's not... Now, had I read it that way, when I was in the beginning of studying philosophy, I would be a different person. I wouldn't have gone into philosophy. I was worried about what, is that, what does that mean? You know, what's the truth? Where's the truth of it? I was truth dominated. But this way I would say, look, God made this performative. Who is he talking to? Talking to the ancient culture. He's not talking to me. I would have bypassed my whole life. <laughs> On the other hand, by not having bypassed it, I got a great education, and it's never too late to learn what is the text talking about. Very big point for me and understanding. And so, so here was this point about the nature of language that uh, used, nature used, and the life, health metaphors were easily used by Hitler and Nazism. If you read Mein Kampf, you'll see that in the book, it's not a bad book, Hitler talks about the, the culture and not just remain in politics, but the whole thing, and you see there was this concern, big concern, with health and, uh, and life, youth life metaphors. And so it, Nietzsche lent, it, lent himself to that whole, that whole picture. Okay, and the, and the basic point that I mentioned was that uh, he played a big role in my own development and widening up of looking at things from not exclusively the narrow abstract space of, of truth and falsity. And to top it off, what I found was, by returning to Heidegger, Heidegger wrote on Nietzsche. And Heidegger, when you read his material, you see, never mind that he joined the party. It's a separate issue. In 1933, he joined the Nazi party to become rector, the president of the university. His claim was that he was so fed up with German philosophy that he wanted to have a renaissance in the university world, in Freiburg. Whether it's true, when he left, he did leave eventually. This remains a big issue and a stain on Western civilization to the certain extent that even some of the students would say, look, don't deal with Heidegger without mentioning who he was, what happened to the party. Okay, I read the material from Google, and I read his own account of 1933, of the speeches that he made to the students, of try, how to try to, to get this upswing. Of course, he related to the youth. There was a youth movement in Germany. He set up jobs and so on. So in the beginning, the National Socialist movement was doing things. It wasn't just standing still. Okay, so this is the thing. And what did I discover? Lo and behold, that even though Austin introduce the performative to do philosophical work to s bring insights into different domains of discourse, into ethics, into psychology, into philosophy. So this was done by Austin, who wrote on the performative utterance. All of a sudden, I find in Heidegger the use of the performative. 
And so what makes him distinctive is that he's now breaking with tradition. Tradition in philosophy and metaphysics was true or false. What is the basis of things that exist? What is the basis of experience? What, 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 is there anything underneath? What's the difference between science and clarification of being? The topic is being. Being. What is being? From Plato on was it was a tradition of trying to understand and define it, define being. And here we have in Heidegger a realization that you can't define it in the usual way. We can talk about it in a way which is not it's somehow it's left up, it's left indeterminate. And you can't really build on it. And part of that not building on it is that there's no need to build on it. Why? Because the principles of this hiding here, the principles of metaphysics come in from the performative that's called positing. To posit is to say, I posit. When Descartes takes Euclidean geometry and he looks at the axiom set, I posit the axiom set. Okay? Now I have theorems. And it does work, and I have a mathematical system called Euclidean geometry. Okay, but you don't clarify, you don't justify the axioms. You accept the axioms as given by the performative. When you say, you don't examine the psychological process the complicated psychology that's operative in that use of language. You go from there. You say, now you're married. Here are the consequences. No, as you deal, you pull out, you abstract away the psychological dynamics from the work that the performative does. And that's what you do. So what I found was something that I never realized before when I taught 17th century philosophy, which was uh, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, gave a course on Descartes, even in Israel I had a class and I gave a course on Descartes, I never realized. He didn't have to justify, he posited. He took as a given, I think, therefore I am. He took it as a performative, as a given. It <coughs> looks like an assertion, because it's stated in assertive language. <coughs> and one of the points I made many times is that sometimes the, the look in the text, it's conceptually a performative, but it's written like an assertion, like in the Chumash text. Nobody caught it. For centuries, nobody caught it. Of course, after Austin, when it's on the map, and after the anthropological entry, which emphasizes the performative, I even asked the reader to imagine living in a culture when there's no, where there's no logic, no conception of historical time, of chronology, okay? And, and dominance on performative language and not assertive language. What would the culture look like? I said to the reader, try to figure out what that would be. Did they talk so much? I, I don't know. I can name in one of the culture, these cultures. I guess I would venture to say they don't talk that much. We talk. We are, we are a talking society. We talk. And most of the talk is assertions. Second is commands and etza, giving advice. And third is performing. So I asked the reader to just imagine what would it be like. You do things and everything, but you don't talk so much. You don't talk. Anyway, to end on a different note, I was reading the material on uh, on narcissism, and some of the research has come forth. A very interesting piece that I picked up was that uh, that in the last twenty years there's been a significant increase in first-person language in America. He only did it for America. Significant. I mean, big numbers. Significant. Now, included in the first-person language is self-bestowed performers. 
But talking about the eye, he found out as a piece of research to indicate uh, the way I look at the research, you know, that there's a certain self-love that's required in order for you to love somebody else. One of the big points in Reb Nachman is precisely that. Reb Nachman talks about giving yourself l'chavzchut, giving yourself the benefit of the doubt. Reb Nachman says in religion and in Torah, we lost giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt for the good. We're always looked on the, looking at the Avera side, that we fell into the Avera, but we're not looking at the positive side. We're not enjoying those mitzvot that we did do. We're worried that we're about the mitzvot that we didn't do. So Rav Nachman has a general principle that it has to relate to yourself before it can relate to others. So in a big famous piece about L'chav Schut, giving L'chav Schut benefit of the doubt to others, he says, well, we should first give the benefit of the doubt to ourselves. And the same with narcissism. With an, with a, without a self-love, a self-respect, a self-involvement, and all the things that go with it, from the outside it looks like, you know, real narcissism, real love of self, real, real pathological condition. You, or like in Chumash, when Chazal bring Yosef, that he looked in the mirror all the time. Well, the question is that. So there's a healthy narcissism and a sick narcissism. I hadn't known, it came through the literature, I hadn't known what Nietzsche and Nietzsche, but Freud did write a piece. I didn't realize that. An early essay he did write on narcissism. Self, so I, I, I. And I, uh, just in going over this material, I asked myself again about me. I do an, I do an awful lot of eye talking. <laughs> I, I talk so much. No, isn't it true? <laughs> right? So I asked myself, I mean, how am I to interpret that? Am I really that bad? Am I really, yes. am I, am I really that No, I've turned people off in the past, so I must, be, I must be doing something wrong. But anyway, there is an issue here about how much, where to draw the line, and how much, and the different types of localizations of narcissism. I didn't realize it was a big, I, I just took off 20 pages without the references, but there's a big a big uh, package of materials that deal with this. And to end on the note about the uh, performative, I hadn't realized, but in the personality literature, on personal identity, it has become a fundamental concept used by therapists and so forth in the, in the field. So that slowly in the 20th century, the 21st century, 50 years after Austin, and after Nietzsche, and after the proper understanding of Heidegger, all three of whom focus on the power of the performative in different directions, we are moving cl at least a little step closer to what I call a fundamental ingredient of Jewishness that was exemplified by somebody like Nietzsche. Okay. Nietzsche, oh. 1844 to 1900. That's his, his, his dates. He died young. Okay, 18, 1844 to 1900. Recently, five, six years ago, a young, some fellow here in Israel wrote a book on Nietzsche and the Jewish orientation. What his view of Judaism was, and so forth, and he took the trouble to make a list of all the passages in Nietzsche where he talks about Jews and Judaism. Hmm. And it turned out that Nietzsche wrote 12, 13 books uh, of different sizes, you know, and uh, it turns out that he talked about the Jews in 65, 68 places. Hmm. And he explains in the book what his criteria was, you know, because sometimes he didn't mention the word Jew, but he was talking about the Jews and so on and so on. Okay, and then he, he wrote this book, and he concluded, after his work, that 
Nietzsche's writings contain some of the greatest praise heaped upon the Jewish people by a non-Jew since Bill on the Prophet. That's this guy. After <coughs> studying the material and putting it together, and he had some tables which show you the picture of where he wrote about this, where he wrote about that, and so on. And that was his basic conclusion, that Nietzsche was in, in fundamental respects pro-Jewish. Yeah. And so the title of tonight's talk is Nietzsche's Jewishness. He wasn't Jewish by birth or anything, he didn't convert or anything like that. However, he had a Jewish, or he latched onto or caught certain dimensions of Jewishness and of Judaism that, for me, played a big role in widening my vistas in philosophy and getting out of classical philosophical problems and into the contemporary period. Okay, so Nietzsche. Nietzsche wrote God is Dead, one of the associations that everybody has with Nietzsche, the average person, God is Dead. He wrote a book called Beyond Good and Evil. What's beyond? What's he talking about? Very suggestive of good and evil, the phrase suggests the tree, the Eitz Hadas, Tovara, the tree of good and evil. And from what Nietzsche does, as we'll see later, uh, it's not unreasonable that he caught something that's very important that I've mentioned many times, that in the text we have two trees, however they interpret it, but we have a tree of of good and evil, see? And then we have a tree of life. And what Nietzsche surely had in his mind when he entitled the book Beyond Good and Evil, that something was beyond good and evil, the other tree. And interestingly enough, as I pointed out many times, it does not say the tree of, of life and death. It says the tree of life not the tree of life and death, even though in other parts of the Chumash it does put together Chaim and Mavit. But in the fundamental story of Gan Eden, it's the Eitz HaChaim and not Eitz HaChaim Mavit. And so what Nietzsche was talking about was for sure, when he entitled the book Beyond Good and Evil, he was certainly relating to that. Okay. And indeed, one of his other famous things that he's known for is, and it's a refrain that goes through his writings, is what he calls, Yea to life. So here we see again, God is dead. Yea to life gives a little strengthening to this intuition of mine about the name of the, name of the book. Yes. Okay. One of the things that this guy found out in his inquiries, just putting down the places where he talks about Jews and Judaism, one of the things that he found out was that most of the negative or the criticisms about Judaism, because Nietzsche, is, you can't just go to the texts and say, okay, here's, here's Nietzsche's Jewishness and it's so strong that there's nothing else. He never wrote a comment against the Jews and so, well, that's not true. If you look at the texts, the different texts in different places, different contexts. Sometimes he's writing against the Jews. And sometimes he's writing in favor of the Jews and for the Jews. So now we have our problem. What 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 sense are we going to make out of that? God is dead, but we have yet to life. What, what, how are we going to put it together? He wrote a book at the end of his life called Will to Power. All right, how are we going to put together in a consistent, coherent way any kind of a talk that will yield a conclusion that Nietzsche had Jewishness in a very strong way and was, like this guy says, uh, a great philosopher, pro-Jewish. Okay, so that's our problem for tonight. How are we going to put these things together? So it's a, a refrain that goes through his different writings, is yea to life, and that's a principle in his orientation. Okay. So, 
this was the result of this guy, and I was saying that he found that most of the time, most of the places that Nietzsche talked against Jews, against Judaism, was in the kind of, I mean, that's the kind, most of the places, the other way around, most of the places where Nietzsche was talking favorably about Jews and Judaism was in context where he was talking about Christianity. Hmm. So in, this is what part of this guy's research found, that most of the places where Nietzsche, or a good many of the places, I won't say most, but a good many of the places that Nietzsche talks favorably about the Jews, he's in a comparative framework. Compared to the Christians, compared to Christianity, Judaism is unbelievable. <laughs> and Nietzsche wrote. In other words, the criterion is very simple. A person could say, look, you know, and there are people today who are leaving Judaism, but have Jewishness, and their Jewishness is very strong in different respects, but they're not in the mitzvot theologic framework that all of us grew up with. They're breaking out and taking Jewishness. And so there's a whole variation. Some link it with humanism, some link it with, with uh, how many people we have in sciences that make the Nobel Prize and so on and so on. Jew Jewishness is, uh, you know, when somebody is proud of Einstein, because he didn't give in, and he remembered, and he kept to be Jewish. He could be wrong, he could be a bad philosopher and a good physicist, but he has Jewishness. Ben-Gurion, and go down the line, and you see that there's a whole term, and try to pin it down, and get its characteristics. However, that's where the material is today. And our problem is, how do we balance out Jewishness with Judaism? For me, of course, the goal is, if we don't do something, I call it to infuse Judaism with some Jewishness, <laughs> we, we're not so sure about the future. And our goal is to try to put some of that in, uh, in an organized way. And so Nietzsche uh, made this statement in the comparative sense, and it fits this guy's research, that he talked positively about the Jews, when he was in this uh, context. Okay. Now, Nietzsche said God is dead. Now, what do you mean by that? What? what, 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 what? And did he make an analysis? Did he study, take time out to study proofs for God's existence? <laughs> like you, Like I did? I also said, you know, does God exist? And what do I do with this? Is it required for Judaism? So I studied the topic for years. Wrote, Nietzsche wrote, uh, you know, this famous piece. Nietzsche wrote this famous piece that uh, I'll read it for you. In the mid 19th century, Nietzsche set forth his yea to life orientation to the individual society, poly, and culture. His non-theism, God is dead, allowed him to say and do things that were beyond norms of the day. The Bible, as ordinarily viewed by non-Jews, refers to what they call the Old and New Testament as one. And Nietzsche said, again, writing about the Jews, but in the context of comparison to Christian, Christianity, Nietzsche says, the, the, the worst sin, the most abominable, abominable sin against the spirit uh, that, liberal, that literary Europe has on its conscience is the gluing together of the New Testament, a kind of rococo of taste in every respect, connecting it to the Old Testament to make one book, the Bible. Now, that's an example of a very powerful statement by Nietzsche of the greatness of Judaism in the contextual, in the comparative framework. And of course, that's enough to tell you that he's pro-Jewish, that he has a Jewish side. But what we want to do tonight is to pick up and add a dimension to that 
view, namely that it's not from the comparative point of view, that's true. But there are other things in nature that are, stand on their own and are more indicative of his understanding or his favorite or his sensitivity to Judaism and Jewishness. Ju I'm using the term Judaism as the religion, which rests on a belief, a few theological beliefs, and the doing of the mitzvot, learning Torah, familiar to all of us. And Jewishness is the, a, a psychological package, that's how we say, of associations that boil down to am I happy I was born a Jew or am I sad I was born a Jew?